Welcome. We're so glad you're here. My name's Ron Bull. I'm one of the ministers here at West Town, and we're just thankful that you've chosen to join us this morning. I'm excited about this message. In fact, I'm so excited that I'm going to have to ask you to do one thing. You need to reach down next to your chair, and you need to find the seat belt, and you need to just bring that across and buckle it in, because we're going we're gonna to go for a ride this morning. And it, I, hopefully for you, and it has been for me, an amazing journey, just kind of Falling in love with what God's doing. So we're going to answer one question this morning. We're going to face one tension that, uh, that maybe you have asked yourself before. Here's the question that we're going to ask this morning. What is the meaning of life? There you go. It's a small one, right? As soon as we get that answer, we'll be done. We'll close up the service and we'll head for the house, right? Pretty easy stuff, right? You probably um, think we can do this pretty fast. Here's the deal. People ask this question all the time, right? I mean, you've asked it. You've asked it maybe even to other people. You've said, hey, what is, what is the meaning of life? What is this all about? Why am I here? What's our purpose? Right? We want to know the answer to that question. And maybe if, you, uh, if you've lived uh, a little longer, um, you might even know that the answer to the question is 42, right? Anybody? 42? Some of you are going, I don't know what you're talking about. Um, you have to you have to read uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy to know what that where that's going. Or maybe you think that when we say what's the meaning of life, you go, oh, that's a Monty Python movie. I've seen that, or maybe you haven't seen that, which is probably maybe good. I don't know. Um, so there you go. There's a, there's a couple answers. It's even the name of a movie that's coming out in a couple weeks that's uh, be in theaters. Um, so maybe you go, oh yeah, I saw the trailers for that. Yeah, meaning of life. Okay, but we know, ultimately, that's not really what we're talking about, right? When you lay in bed at night, you're not wondering if that's the meaning of life. You're trying to go, what, why am I here? What's going on? And I, I'll give you this warning. Don't, don't Google that question. Um, you'll get all types of crazy answers. Um, some of them have visuals involved, and you're like, oh, my word, what do you guys, this is not the meaning of life. Uh, people just have no idea. Um, while I was looking, I come across a video, and it's this guy who goes out on the street, walks up to people randomly, and says, hey, I got a question. Hey, will you, what's the meaning of life? And they're all like, whoa. Yeah, one guy thinks that he's asking for money, and he's like, hey, I ain't got anything. He's like, I just want to know the meaning of life. And the guy's like, you just want money, don't you? Like, what do you? So it's, it was interesting to hear their answers. Uh, some people took a stab at it, right, and came up with some things, and they were... They were, um, a lot of times, they were uh, feel-good answers. But as I listened to them, I was saddened by the fact that so many of them were empty. They just, like, they were just, they were, they're meaningless. And I thought, man, that's so sad that we're searching for, we have this tension for what is the meaning of life, and yet so many people end up living their whole lives and never get that answered. And I, I don't want to, I don't, this may sound arrogant, but... I found the meaning of life. I found the meaning of life, and it was in a love letter from God. God wrote a love letter to say, hey, he's created us, and he's created this story, and he wants us to be a part of it. And in it, we find, uh, it's it's the story we find ourselves in, right? That's, That's what we're talking about, the story where we find ourselves. And Maybe for you, you look at that. Oh, first, let me, let me, I'll just go through the chapters real quick because we've broken into seven chapters. Here's creation, which uh, J- Dean talked about two weeks ago. George talked about crisis. We're, today we're going to talk about calling. And then we're just going to go through the rest of them. Conversation, Christ, church, and then celebration. And w- the reason that we chose seven and we chose seven words is we try to make it simple enough so that as we hear these, as you and I hear them over and over again, that potentially will remember them, and they will help us retell the story we find ourselves in. If somebody were to ask you at work or, or at, around the dinner table or something, they'd say, hey, what is the meaning of life? You could, maybe they may, won't ask it in those exact words, but you could go, hey, let me, let me just unpack what's going on here. What is the meaning of life? Now, that title, the, uh, the story we find ourselves in, when I first heard it, if you're like me, when I first heard it, I just kind of got it on one level. It's like, oh, I get it. Yeah, we're, there's a story going on, and we're somewhere in it, and so therefore, I get it. But there's so many more meanings to that phrase, and I want to make sure that we don't miss it today. So before we get going far, very far here, I want to just deal with that title and look at the three different meanings that I see in it. First of all, you'll see the obvious meaning, and that is there is a story, and we find ourselves in one spot 
in the story, right? If you go down, you know, we're, we're, creation's over, crisis, all that, you know, we see that's over, okay. We're, church is going on now, haven't got to celebration, so we find ourselves in the story, right? And that helps us put context to our life. We know where we fall in the story. It's the story we find ourselves in. That's the first meaning. The second meaning is it's the story we find ourselves not just in one spot, we find ourselves in every spot. So that we don't just hear about creation, but we experience creation. And we don't just experience, we actually get to play a part in creating. We, we create. That's, that's pretty amazing. So, so it's, a, it's a story that we're in that chapter. The crisis, right? We go, wait, we can relate with that because we know the crisis. We still feel the crisis today. When our relationships go south, right? Our relationship with God, our relationship with others, our relationship with creation, we go, we know there is a crisis. So it's not just that we find ourselves in one spot in the story, we find ourselves in every spot in the story. And then, the third meaning, the story we find ourselves in, is all of a sudden this like light bulb went on in my head and I was like, ah! We find ourselves. Like, there are a lot of competing stories in the world, a lot of stories that you could choose, narratives that you could choose to base your life on. And the world provides a lot of those for us. Hey, live this way, do this, whatever. Try to make this your goal, make that your goal, right? And so you can try to live out that story. But the reality is, what you will find out is if you live out any of the other stories, you will find that you don't find yourself. Ultimately, you lose yourself in that story. For instance, college, for a lot of our college students, starts back tomorrow. And so they head back into the college classrooms. And so we take a look at the American dream, right? The American dream is you get good grades while you're in uh, elementary school, middle school, high school, right? So that you can get into a good college, right? So that you can get a good degree and you can graduate with honors so that you land the right job, the perfect job, the good job, so that you can bank a lot of money, So that at some point you can relax and know that I accomplished all this and I achieved the goal, I'm I'm, I'm successful, right? Here's the deal. In that story alone, you will not find yourself. And what's sad is so many people go all the way through their life seeking that story, living that story, before they finally get to a point and they go, oh, I've actually lost myself. The same is true for people who live a story that says there isn't really a God. Like we'll just reason him away and we'll say that somehow we went from pond muck, somehow this earth went from no life to life. We don't know exactly how it happened, but there is no God. And what happens is, which is the irony of it is, people go there trying to find out their meaning in life. They try to go, I don't get it, so let's just take a look at this and this is how. And in the end, they don't find themselves. They end up losing themselves. So this truly is, in every sense of the words, the story we find ourselves in. And to me, that is the amazing part of it. As we understand the story, we understand our place in it. As we understand the story, we understand the story's place in us. And as we live out the story, we truly find ourselves In the book in which this series is titled, from which we titled this book, um, Brian McLaren says this about God's story. This story is the best one around. It has the truest news, the deepest views, the uh, the highest theme, the most inspiring dream, the plot full of meaning and magic, vigor and rigor, startle and sparkle, emotion and motion. If you give it a fair hearing, I think you'll agree. The best things, in my opinion, about this story that we find ourselves in is number one, it's true. Number two, it includes you. And number three, it explains you. And it is the only story that can do all of that for all of us, which is an amazing feat. So, you got your seatbelt on, right? Because we're going to just do a quick review here. And for me, I'm a guy who has to see it on a chart, and I'm a guy who has to see it on a map. i got to see times and places. And so maybe this is like you're going to go, oh, my word, this doesn't help me at all. But hopefully for some of you, you'll go, oh, finally somebody put it in a way that I can visualize it. So we're going to take a look here, first of all, at a, at a timeline. 
And so if you look at that timeline, it might be hard to read the names in it. Some of you may have seen it before because I've used it before. But it's got, uh, it's got the name starting in Adam all the way down. What I want you to notice is the Bible gives us pretty specific information. It gives us um, how long each person lived before they had their son that's listed. And then it also tells us how long they lived after that. And so it's pretty easy to go, oh, I can just put this in order and just kind of plot this out, right? Now, you got to kind of disregard the dates at the top and the bottom. They're kind of guesses because there are chunks in the story, in the narrative, where they don't give exact times for, for kind of some big chunks. When, when, when they've gone off to captivity or something, we don't know exactly the exact length. And so that would fluctuate it. Now, Surely I'm not the only one that has plugged all that into an Excel spreadsheet and come up with formulas so you can just, you know, put in different guesses. Right? Am I the only one that did that? Really? Man, wow. I thought there'd be some more of me like, uh, I don't know, whatever. So yeah, so I put it in an Excel spreadsheet, right? And I got the numbers in there, and so then you could just put in some different guesses, and then you can change those numbers at the top and the bottom pretty easily. Um, because, I, you know, we're just, we're taking a stab in the dark. But as you look at that, you'll see creation and we're going in this chart, we'll go all the way to the flood. Now, those are two accounts, two accounts in scripture that scientists go, yeah, they didn't happen. Didn't happen. Didn't, no creation, no flood, right? And, and you hear that assumption made all the time. Well, I put a great article in the U version. If you happen to be using U version, if you want to look up U version and you find this event, you just find an event and uh, this event's on there. I put a link to an article that is a great article about scientists' dilemma with going, hey, we can explain it all except for one minor thing. We don't know how at one point it went from zero life to some life, even at a small level. How did it go from no life to some life? They can't, they can't figure that out. They can't explain it. And uh, so... They're, they're trying to say, hey, we can reason this away, but in, in, in a way they're going, we can't quite do it. And in a way it takes more faith to almost believe that it didn't happen, right? Um, so then you got the flood. Scientists going, it didn't happen. There was no flood. Recently, this is like August 4th, articles came out in scientific journals. I don't know if you guys read this stuff. I don't always read it, but I come across it in the news. And there's some amazing headlines that have come out about a, a find that occurred in China just in the last month. And they've revealed this. And here's a headline for Scientific America. Ancient Chinese mega flood may be fact, not fiction. Myth of land-changing deluge supported by geology, as are flood legends from Scandinavia to Tibet. Here's a headline for the Tech Insider. These skeletons just proved a mythical mega flood really happened. And so you read these articles and they're going, you know what? There was, there was obviously a huge flood in China at this time. And around the world, they found different evidence to go, there was a huge flood. Ironically, as I'm reading this, and they're just saying, oh, this was just the Yellow River in China. They're saying, it happened somewhere around 4,000 years ago. And I go, huh, I don't know. That's, that's pretty close, right? You know, if you're just taking a stab in the dark, 4,000 years ago, maybe there was a big mega flood. And so, interesting, and I put some links to those articles in there as well. So two weeks ago, Dean talked about creation, chapter one. Last week, George talked about the crisis, chapter two. And the crisis, as George pointed out, started in the garden, right, with a tree. But the crisis, like, came to a head with a flood, right, big time. All of a sudden, God goes, I'm starting over. And so we see that laid out here. And as you look at that, there's just a few other things that you probably notice, I notice, is I go, hey, somebody's lifespan doesn't look like everybody else's lifespan, right? Right? Enoch, you might know what the Bible says. It says in Genesis 5, 23 and 24, it says, Enoch lived 365 years, which at that time people lived a long time. But Enoch lived 365 years, walking in close fellowship with God. Then one day he disappeared because God took him. Wow. And then you see Methuselah. Uh, three verses after it talks about Enoch, it talks about Methuselah, and it sums his life up like this. Methuselah lived 969 years, and then he died. Like, oh, wow, and then he died. Okay. Well, if you look at the dates, Lamech actually died five years before the flood. So Methuselah's son died five years before Methuselah did. Methuselah died the year of the flood. That tells me a couple things. I mean, one of two things, right? Either Methuselah died in the flood, which could be true, or potentially God said, you know what? 
I'm going to wait to flood the earth until Methuselah is dead, and then I'm going to flood the earth. So maybe you just died earlier that year, and then God goes, okay, we're, we're ready now. We're doing this thing. Okay, so pretty wild stuff as we look at this. And then you'll see that uh, Noah's son Shem's there. He had Shem, Ham, and Japheth. I only put Shem there because that's the way the lineage goes. And now we're going to move on and see the next uh, after the flood. So now you take a look at these, all of a sudden you'll notice another thing. Dates get shorter, right? Lives get shorter as, as after the flood. God says in the Bible that he made it that way. He made it where people weren't going to live as long. And so you look down that list, uh, a lot of names we've never heard of. If you look at Peleg, anybody know what happened in Peleg's life? I like to call him Pegleg. I don't know why. I'm like, Pegleg. Anybody know? Tower of Babel, right? The only thing that we're actually told about in Scripture that happened between the flood and Abram. And so you got this Tower of Babel that occurred during Peleg's life. And then you get down to the person we call Abraham. He was originally called Abram. And Abram's where I want to spend a little bit of time today because Abram has an amazing story. Abram, get this, three different world religions point their, their history back to this man. Judaism, obviously, right? Christianity, we, we springboard off them, right? And then Islam, right? Muslims point their history back to this same man. And you go, that's pretty wild that that many people in the world all go, yeah, that guy, he, he, he existed. We know he did, right? And we point our history back to him. And so pretty amazing thing about Abram. And then Abram had sons, and uh, do, 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 do. oh, and here's the, here's another cool thing about Abram. Abram was one of the first people um, in in his lifetime and the people around him who believed in one true, consistent, faithful God. There was a thought in that time, and it has continued through history that there were gods of different areas, and so if you were in in this region, that god would either protect you or or maybe he would punish you, right? Um, but, but if you went to this region, that God's not there, right? And Abram had this belief that there was a God everywhere, consistent, right? And he wasn't fickle. He didn't sometimes feel like not being around or whatever. So Abram had this belief, and we're going to learn a little bit more about his faith. But first, I've got to show you a map. Here's a map. So this is old school map, but you've got Mediter- Mediterranean Sea over here. You've got the Persian Gulf over there. You can kind of see the Black Sea up there. You can kind of see those, those names are probably so small, you may not be able to read them, but that's okay. Let me just start at the beginning. The scholars often think that um, between Euphrates and the Tigris River, somewhere in there is where the land, the Garden of Eden was. Um, some, some people believe that it is now currently under the Persian Gulf, that it, it actually is underwater at this point. And so they think that's where God started it all. And then there was a flood, right? And they ended up somewhere on a mountaintop. And many scholars would think that that's up in Turkey, and uh, there's mountaintops there, and they're looking for a Noah's Ark and have some... Uh, success at that. But anyway, so as you look at that, they probably ended up there. And then everybody, that's, that's everybody on earth at that point, right, that's still living. And so then they migrate down because what we know is they tried to build a tower, right? The tower of Babel. And around Babylonia, what became Babylonia is where that occurred. And then Abram's family must have just kind of hung around that area, not gone too far because they ended up down in this area called Ur, this town called Ur that excavations have uncovered. And so there's Abram's family. And then Terah, Abram's dad, ends up deciding he's going to head to Canaan. And so he takes Abram and his wife, Sarah, and he takes um, Lot, his grandson, and they head for Canaan. But they probably didn't just cut across the desert. They probably took the paths that people were already taking at the time. And, uh, and so they probably headed up and around, and they ended up in, in a town or region called Haran. And they just decided, you know what, this is pretty nice. It's next to a river. We like this. Let's just stay here. Let's just, you know, kind of put down roots here. And they lived there a long time until God comes along to Abram and says, hey, it's time to go. I want you to go on down to Canaan and leave everybody up here except for Sarah and Lot and take them down here to Canaan. And so here's, here's how that says it in Scripture. I'm going to read out of Genesis 12. The Lord said to Abram, Leave your native country, your relatives and your father's family, and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous. And you will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. 
And get this, all the families on earth will be blessed through you. Now, the Bible doesn't record any interaction between God and humans from the time of the flood until the time that God comes and speaks to Noah, I mean, to Abram. And so here it is, God decides, okay, I'm going to go talk to Abram. And what we get here, what we get a glimpse of is God saying basically this, hey, Abram, um, I want to invite you back into my story. I'm telling a story and I want you to be a part of it. But God could have just said, hey, Abram, you're the only guy I want to be a part of the story, right? I I don't want everybody else to be a part of the story. But what we read in this message from God is God saying, hey, Abram, I want want to invite you back into the story. Not only am I inviting you back, I'm inviting everybody back. I want everybody back into the story. And so Abram is blessed, not so he could just take in the blessing. Abram's blessed so that he can turn around and bless others. And you got to get this, because if this is the story we find ourselves in, this is the story that we need to live out as well, right? We need to be a blessing to others. God said, I will bless you, and you will be a blessing to others. And he said, all the families on earth will be blessed through you. Now, take note of this. God is calling us into the same story. So we need to know that when Christians assume they are chosen only to be blessed and forget that they are blessed to be a blessing... They distort their identity and they drift from God's calling for them. When Christians see themselves as blessed to the exclusion of others rather than for the benefit of others, they become a part of the problem instead of part of the solution. God promised Abraham, made a promise here, and he promised to bless him. But he didn't bless him as a reservoir. He blessed him as a conduit. I think of I think of those huge cranes that have the tubes that take cement from a cement truck, right, and take it up to the 10th floor that they're pouring on a building, right? And I think they just take that thing and they just aim it wherever they need to pour cement, right? That's what they're doing, you know, through that thing. Can you imagine what would happen if that thing said, you know, I'm just going to hang on to it. Not gonna, I'm not going to pass it on. I'm just going to hang on to it. It wouldn't work, right? We are like that. Like, we're not, we're not given blessings so that we can just hang on to them. We're given blessings so that we can bless others. Which brings us to today's bottom line. God is calling us into his story to bless others as he blesses us. Now, I'm, I'm not like way hip on the Twitter stuff and all that, but for the younger crowd, is this is how you might say it. Hashtag blessed to bless. That's where we're at, right? We're blessed to bless. That's why God blesses us. You want to know the meaning of life? The meaning of life is found in the story we find ourselves in. You want to know how to live out the story we find ourselves in? Bless to bless. That's how we live it out. We turn around and we bless others. Jesus said something similar in Mark 8. He said, if you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake and for the sake of the good news, you will save it. Maybe another way to say it is you will find it. God is calling us into his story to bless others as he blesses us. Hashtag bless to bless. This, this is the story where you can find yourself if you want to. But before you decide whether you want to jump into that story, let me tell you two events in Abram's life that I just can't pass up because they will unpack for us what story we're being invited into and who's inviting us into the story. I want you to get a grasp of who that is. So event number one. Abram, and uh, he's been told by God, hey, I'm going to bless you. He's given three basic things. I'm going to bless you so you'll be a blessing. I'm going to make you into a great nation, and I'm going to give you land, right? Three big blessings. And Abram's over 75 years old, and he believes God because the Bible says he believed and it was credited to him as righteousness. So he believed that God could do what he was saying. But at the same time, I think there was a little bit in Abram that's maybe a little bit like you and me, and you're like, could we... Can I get that in writing? Because I don't have any kids yet, and I, right now I'm still wandering in other people's land. Like, I'd, I'd like to get it in writing just so I know for sure that you really did mean what you said, right? That you, What you've been saying all along. And so they didn't have lawyers. They didn't have contracts. There wasn't a way that they could put all that stuff down. So they had what was called a ceremony called the blood covenant. Now, let me, let me unpack this blood covenant for you, and it may gross you out, but you hang, bear with me, okay? When they wanted to make an agreement with somebody and they wanted to make sure that the other person was going to live up to the terms of the agreement, what they would do is they would take some animals, a few animals, they would kill them, 
They would dig a trench. They would lay half of each of side of each animal on one side and half on the other side of the trench and let the blood from those animals pool into the trench. Then they would take their sandals off and they would, one at a time, walk the path of that trench in the blood, barefooted. And what they were saying when they did that was, if I don't live up to my end of the agreement, if I don't live up to my end of the bargain, right, you can do to me what we've done to these animals, right? You can do to me. And, and so it would happen. If somebody didn't live up to their end of the agreement, you'd find him, his, he was thrown off a cliff somewhere, and everybody knew that was, that was part of it. Like he agreed, and everybody knew it, and he didn't do it, and they, they took out the agreement on him. Right? That's pretty serious agreement. So Abram asked God, hey, I'd like to have some type of, you know, formal agreement. And God goes, okay, go get, go get these animals. And he tells him to go get a heifer, go get a ram, and go get a goat, and go get a, a dove and a pigeon. Go get those animals. God doesn't tell him what to do with them. If you, you may have read this story and thought, what in the world? God didn't tell him what to do. He just said, go get them. But you'll notice, if you read the story, Abraham comes back, cuts them in half, lays one on each side, you know, half of it on each side, and lets the blood pool in the middle. And you're like, why did Abram do that? He wasn't told by God to do that. Abram knew the covenant. He knew the blood covenant. He knew the agreement, that the way that they would do stuff. And so he had seen it before. Uh, uh, the father of the groom, the father of the bride, they would both say, hey, let's do this thing because if my son does not stay faithful to your daughter like I have said he will... You can do this to me. You can do to me what we did to these animals. And the father of the bride is saying, hey, if, if my daughter is not the pure, loving, you know, isn't the woman that I have promised her to be, right? You can do to me what we've done to these animals. It was a serious thing. They knew this. This happened all the time. And so Abram's like, I, I, I know what I've gotten myself into. Lays out the animals. And what you see as you read the story is, there's just little hints of it, is Abram is kind of dragging his feet on this thing because here's the agreement that they are going to make a covenant on. God's going to say, hey, I will bless you, I will make you a great nation, right, big family, and I will give you land. Here's Abram's part of the agreement. God says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to be holy and blameless. And I want all your descendants to be holy and blameless. That's all I ask. Right? And Abram's like, uh oh, this is a serious agreement, right? I, I, we can't do it. I, what am I going to do? And so you get the idea that that he's kind of dragging his feet on this because it says vultures came and tried to eat at the dead animals that were laying there. This time has passed, right? They're laying there, and, and Abram's like, I'm not ready for this. And so he shoes the vultures off, but he's like, ah, I don't know. And it says he fell into a deep, fitful sleep, right? And he's like, oh, my word, this is crazy. What am I going to do? And then he wakes up at about evening time, and this is what happens. He sees God provide, God in the form of a smoking pot and a flaming torch. God's represented in scriptures with smoke. That's how they followed him by day in the desert and by flame. That's how they followed him by night, right? Over and over again, we see those representing God. And so he sees this and he sees the blood offerings and he sees that God makes the the smoking pot travel through the blood covenant. And then God has the blazing torch, the fiery torch travel through the blood covenant. And in that moment, God is saying, if I don't live up to my end of the agreement, you can do to me what we did to these animals. And if you don't live up to your end of the agreement, you can do to me what we did to these animals. And in that moment, we get a foretaste, a foreshadow, that right in that moment, God said, Jesus is going to die on a cross. Because he's going to live up to where we can't... He's going to pay the price for what when we fail on our end of the covenant. Isn't that amazing? Amazing to see what is going on in the events in Abraham. Second event. You may be more familiar with this one. This is when Abram takes Isaac up on the mountain to sacrifice him, right? God says, I want you to take your son Isaac. I want you to take him up in, to the uh, land of Moriah, to a mountaintop I'll show you, and I want you to sacrifice your son Isaac. And it's like, we read this story and we're like, I don't get it. Now, we kind of give it a little pass because we're like, okay, I kind of get it because it's a test of faith. I get that. 
Um, and we kind of get it because there's a lot of foreshadowing in it. But in general, I still go, uh, uh, there's a lot about it I don't get. I don't get why God would have Abraham even think about taking his son up on a mountaintop to kill him. But I, I, I go, okay, well, maybe this is all just a test of faith and this is the foreshadowing. And you know the foreshadowing. You probably have seen that, right, where God is going to someday provide his son as a sacrifice. But have you ever read this story while you were looking at a map? Maybe you have if you've heard me talk about it because I get so excited about this. Here's a map, and it's a map of that area of Israel. And down in the, in the lower, we've got an arrow pointing to Beersheba. That's where the Bible says that Abraham was living at the time when God came and, and made this request of him. And then up the upper arrow is the land of Moriah. It's where the mountain that God's going to show him is. Now, you've got to take note of this. This map is from much later than Abram's time. We have at this point in the scriptures, if you're reading through Genesis and you're down to Genesis 22, we have never heard the name Jerusalem. We've never heard the name Bethlehem. They probably don't exist at this point. right? Nobody's probably formed a town there. It's just an area that people know as the land of Moriah. Now, we do know that Hebron and Mamre have both already occurred in Abram's life. Because Abram's not only camped there, but he's built an altar to God there. Pretty cool, right? So we know they're there. And so if Abram's going to make this journey, we kind of get a sense, I get a sense, he'd probably go through the places he's been, right? Go to where he's camped before, where he built that altar, and head on up to the land of Moriah. We don't know what path he took. We're only guessing, right? But it would make logical sense that it's somewhere in that swath right there. Now, let me read this story to you, and you look at the map, and you kind of think about this. The next morning, Abraham Abraham got up early. He saddled his donkey and took two of his servants with him, along with his son Isaac. Then he chopped wood for a fire for a burnt offering and set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, get this, on the third day of the journey, on their journey, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He's within eyesight somewhere out in the distance. Stay here with the donkey, Abraham told the servant. The boy and I will travel a little farther. We will travel, we will worship there, and then we will come right back. Okay, so you just kind of project out in your own mind, look at that map, and kind of go, okay, they've gone three days, they're within eyesight, but they still have a ways to go further, probably enough that they could get wherever they're going the rest of the way and back in one day. So they got maybe half a day's journey further, right? Three days, half a day journey further. In your mind, kind of pick a point in the map and say, that's where I think they are. And then I'll read on. So Abram placed the wood for the burnt offering on Isaac's shoulders, while he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them walked on together, Isaac turned to Abraham and said, Father, yes, my son, Abraham, we have the fire and the wood, the boy said, but where is the sheep for the burnt offering? Now, keep looking at the map. They're now somewhere between where they left the servants, wherever you picked, right? and the upper arrow, where the land of Moriah, somewhere up on a mountaintop that God's going to show them there. Somewhere in there, when Isaac asked this question, and now I want you to catch the full foreshadowing that's going on with Abram's answer here. Abram answers Isaac's question about the sacrifice and says, God will provide the lamb. Now, what if? Is it possible that as they're journeying along and they've left the servants behind and they're headed on up to the mountaintop that God's shown them in the land of Moriah, that potentially they are standing, when Isaac asked this question, journeying along in the very spot that would later become a town called Bethlehem. In the very spot that potentially God would later provide a lamb. Isn't that pretty wild that God could write a story that could look like that? And then, don't, don't, don't just in there, because when you go on up to Jerusalem, when you go on up to the land of Moriah, which became Jerusalem, the, the Jews, the Muslims, and Christians um, all seem to, to have this theory that where the temple was placed in Jerusalem, which now is the Dome of the Rock, right? Where that was placed is the spot where Abram made his sacrifice. Now, Christians and Jews believe that the sacrifice was Isaac, and Muslims believe that the sacrifice was Ishmael. But they all go, he, he made this sacrifice. The story is similar to that point. And they say, this is the spot where it happened. That spot is a thousand feet from where scholars believe Jesus died on a cross. Now, think about this. Israel 
went to Egypt for 400 years between the time that this occurred and the time that they built the temple. Now, is it possible that when they came back and decided to build a temple, they were a thousand feet off? Maybe, right? That maybe when Abram goes to sacrifice Isaac and God stops him and God provides a ram caught in the bushes and they sacrifice the ram, that potentially it occurs in the very spot where later God would give his son. And you go, wow. So, so they're walking along, and where's the sacrifice? And maybe they're in Bethlehem, right where Jesus was born, when he says, where's the sacrifice? And he says, God will provide a lamb. And then they get up there, and they're maybe in the very spot where Jesus later died on the cross when they go, okay, now we're going to sacrifice this ram. And now, don't miss this, because I've wondered this in my life. It's like, when I read this story, it's a little weird that Abram answers Isaac's question by saying God will provide a lamb. And then they get up there and God provides a ram. And you're like, well, it's close. Yeah, I'll give him credit. It's close, right? They were maybe just a little off, um, but it's still pretty close. Or is it possible that when Abram answered Isaac's question, he was actually foreshadowing something that was going to come much later. Yes, on that day, God provided a ram in place as a substitution sacrifice for Isaac. But later, God would provide a lamb in that same spot as a substitution sacrifice for you and for me. That just gives me goosebumps. I don't know about you. And so here's the deal. This is the story we find ourselves in. This is the story that God invites you into. This is a creator who has amazing abilities to write a story, saying, hey, will you be a part of the story with me? Will you join my story? And that's what he says to you and me today. That's amazing. It blows me away. We're going to take a time here where we're going we're to worship We're going to take communion. And the cool part right now is when you go around the table and you take the cup and the bread that's around the back at your own pace and desire, when you take that, I want you to, I I challenge you to think about the story that God has been writing all along that brings us to this moment in our service where we go, wow, that was huge, that God would pay the price. And actually, not as a reaction, God would pay the price knowing it was going to need to happen. He designed us and created us knowing he was going to have to do it because he loves us that much. That's the kind of story he's writing, and that's the kind of story he wants us in. I'm going to be right over here as we sing. If you want to know more about this story, you're like, man, i I got to know more. I want to know how I can be a part of the story. I want to know how I can get into the story. Like, how do I do this? Come talk to me. Man, I'd love to. I'd love to tell you more. Uh, there's so many amazing parts. A baptism is a beautiful symbol that God gives in the story that I go, man, I just got to tell you about it. It's just amazing. Um, so come talk to me. If you need prayer and you're just like, man, I just need somebody to pray right now. I got a lot going on. Come talk to me during this time as we sing. Let's pray as we close. Father God, we are blown away that you would write a story and include us in it in such a powerful way that you would bless us to bless others, that you would would give your Son to prove to us the extent of your love. And then you ask us to then accept that love and then just pass it on. That's huge, and we are so thankful. Be with us as we take this bread and this cup, and we remember what it cost you, and we remember what your story looks like and what your love looks like. We pray this in your son's name. Amen.